I have great pleasure in introducing Dr. Viral. He is a neuro-ophthalmologist at Cincinnati. Over to you, Viral. Okay, thank you, thanks. So this is a part two of our original uh, talk. And last time we, this is the second part of the Diplopia talk, which is double vision. Um, I was talking to Dr. Qatari and uh, he actually mentioned to me that it would be good at getting some feedback just talking about bedside exam. Uh, well, last time we talked about what we do in the neuro-ophthalmology exam. So I, I put a couple slides here just to clarify for some of the questions from last time. So um, in terms of binocular um, uh, double vision, uh, what we're looking for is the misalignment in the eyes and we call that strabismus. So that's what it, uh, it means. So there's various ways to describe strabismus. And in this chart, in this picture that I show that normal, it, you're talking about alignment. So if you look at the alignment of the eyes, that are fusing on a target. So they're looking at something and they're both fixing. The macular vision is fusing on that target. Uh, you can see that the eyes are aligned. When one eye in relation to the other eye is sitting higher than, uh, than the uh, eye that's considered normal, that's, uh, that's uh, hypertropia. When it's lower, it's called hypotropia. And then when it's crossing out, it's exotropia and inward, it's esotropia. So these are some of our terminology that I think it, it, when you see a patient and you can describe them succinctly, these are the terms that we use. Now, you can talk about the control of that movement inward and outward. If it's constant in, then you can call it a constant, it's an esotropia. But if you start to see that there's some movement or there's, it's intermittent that you see it actually turn in, uh, uh, there's a breakdown in fusion and it's turning in, then you can, call, you can describe the control as intermittent. So we can describe the control of the direction as intermittent or constant. Um, so this gets to the, the whole double vision that we talked about. So it's binocular fusion. So if you think about your vision, when you look with one eye, you see from here to here. When you look with the other eye, you see from here to here. So there's overlap here centrally. And that's because both eyes are fusing, with both eyes open, they're fusing the image. And so that's very important because if this eye is misaligned, it's gonna be looking, macular vision will be over here, and this is looking at the target, and that's where you get the symptom of double vision. So there's motor fusion and sensory fusion. And so when there's a misalignment in the motor fusion is what we're, what we're gonna talk about in terms of measuring. So, just this is some stuff that you guys know, but it's it's going to be important just to mention it in the next sequence of uh, of the talk. Uh, so uh, extraocular muscles, there's six of them. Uh, there are twelve cranial nerves that come from the back of the neck. Three are involved in make in moving the eye muscles, and we're going to talk about cranial nerve palsies, and that's that this part of the talk that we had mentioned previously in the last. Uh, the last talk. Um, and so the important things are we have four recti muscles here, 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 and then we have two oblique muscles, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what cranial nerves go to which muscles and uh, what type of misalignment they get and what type of double vision that they get. So, so again, to so the bedside exam, which uh, Dr. Katari told me to focus in on for some of the feedback questions we had from the last talk, uh, we, met, we assess alignment and we assess movement, right? So the motility. So alignment of the eyes, one in relation to the other, and the movement of the eyes. So, um, so the way we actually measure alignment is that we have them fixate at a target, and we describe, and I told you the terms that we use to describe the deviation, but we use prisms to actually bend the image uh, so that you can make up the alignment. So we talked about fusion, in which one eye is looking at the target, the other one is misaligned. So if you can use uh, prisms of different sizes, you can bend the incoming image, image so that you can start to fuse. And that number that they ascribe to the size of the prism, is called prism diopter, that describes the, the degree of um, uh, deviation. So for example, when we check alignment, the thing that you can do at bedside is a corneal reflex alignment where you have a bright light and you put it in front of the patient. You have them look at the light. So you have to tell them to look at the light. The eye that's fixating on the uh, light, you'll see a corneal reflex on, uh, on that eye. And this is, this is a clear example. This eye is deviated inward. You can see that gross uh, misalignment. This is an esotropia of the left eye. That's, you won't miss this, right? But the corneal reflex here 
if you look at it, at this child, it's in the center here and it's in the center here. However, many times this is misdiagnosed because if you look, it looks as though that this eye is turning inward because what they're doing, what people are looking at are the external cues. They're looking at how much white space is there that conjunctiva is less on this side than the other side. And this is called pseudostrabismus because the eyes are actually aligned because the pupil and where the corneal reflex is in the center, okay? Um, but, uh, and in contrast is this case, right? When this child is looking at the light in front of, in front of them, you can see that the corneal reflex is sitting temporally, right? So this eye is actually deviated inward, um, and, and that's why you see a temporal uh, uh, aspect of this corneal reflex. So this is actually misaligned. Uh, and so we use that corneal reflex to look at alignment. And if you look really closely, the funny part is if you look really closely and you look at interviews and you look at, um, you know, uh, uh, on the news and when people taking an interview of somebody up close, there's a bright light on that camera that's shining, you could actually see their corneal alignment. You'll be surprised how many people are actually misaligned uh, um, and you can notice that. And, and I, I just seem to notice it all the time because I'm looking at that all the time. Um, but if you are uh, uh, attuned to that, you'll notice it as well. So um, so th this, is, this is the main thing I wanna tell you about at the bedside that you can do to grossly describe the misalignment or to see and to actually see the misalignment, right? Um, so obviously, if it's, if it's, if it's in the uh, temporal aspect, this eye is turned in. However, if you notice if the eye is up, it's in the, the, the corneal reflex is in the nasal aspect of the pupil uh, uh, um, uh, in relation to the pupil. So those are things that you're gonna be looking for. This is uh, an example in which this eye is misaligned. So this eye is turned inward. Um, and it, you can see that it's seeing double vision because it's looking over here. And for that same target, they're not aligned. So it's not a fusing. But if you take a prism and you put it in front of it, it's going to bend that image over and they'll start to fuse with that prism. And if they say, I, I no longer have double vision in this amount of prism, um, that you can take that measurement. And we actually have a bar of prisms, which are, are actually, uh, uh, the, the larger the base of the prism, um, it, it actually, it's graded that way. So it's at five, 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way down. And so we can put that in front of the patient and say, hey, when are you fusing? And that's how we can measure the deviation um, uh, of the eye. We can do that both horizontally and vertically. So, um, the other ways that we can look at the eye, and this goes back to what I, I talked about in terms of intermittent and the control of the eye, is that you can actually cover the eye and uncover. When you cover the eye and uncover, that's going to tell you if uh, tell you the the gross misalignment, the tropia uh, uh, alignment, so esotropia, exotropia. That's going to talk to you about the gross misalignment. When you go back and forth you're actually doing two things. You are getting the tropia, but you're also disrupting the fusion that's there, and you may get a larger value in your deviation. So that's really important. Um, these measurements are important for us when we want to make strabismus corrections, okay? Now, the, the, the second aspect of the exam at bedside is the ocular motilities. And what you want to see here, so these are the muscles. This is a, a, a really nice picture because this this really tells you the muscles that are involved uh, as you're looking at each of these gazes okay so these are nine you know uh, cardinal gazes that we assess patients on and you'll see a lot of questions showing pictures like this but the most important one so when you assess uh, patients is in primary so you want to know the primary alignment and where they're looking you can see that the corneal reflexes in the center in both eyes the most important thing you're looking for when both eyes moving this is called versions um, you're going to look, when they look all the way to the, to one gaze, you want to see them bury the sclera, okay? So you shouldn't be any, see, you should not be seeing any white, and you know that's a full motility, okay? So obviously when you look, in this case, to the left, the lateral rectus in the left eye is moving the eye to the left, and the medial rectus is uh, engaging the right eye to move uh, to the left. And so, and then obviously it's contralateral muscles when you look into the uh, right gaze, you can see uh, uh, both when they look superior and inferior that the obliques are involved, but the primary muscle is the superior rectus in, in both cases looking up and inferior rectus looking down. 
Uh, and then when these, these side gazes really tell you if the inferior obliques uh, and the superior rectus of the contralateral eye or the inferior oblique and the superior rectus and the contralateral eye are, are affected and the superior lateral gazes and the inferior lateral gazes, you're wondering if the superior oblique and the inferior rectus are involved. So this is a really nice picture to have. And when you're, when you're assessing the different eye movements uh, as you uh, get used to having them look right, left, up, down, and then I have them go at an angle. So they're looking at, up here and all the way down. And you really want to look at both eyes when you do versions. Okay, and, and that's going to be important. I'm going to show you that next when we talked about the cranial nerve palsies. So again, this is, the, this is a um, list that I put up before in the, in the first lecture, because I think it's really important when you get through those steps of questions. First question was, is it monocular, binocular, double vision, right? Two is describe the double vision, because at this point, you're, 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 if it's monocular double vision, that's an ophthalmology issue. You can let them go, okay, and have them see ophthalmology. But if it's a binocular double vision issue, you're going to go to the next question, which is, is it horizontal, vertical, or oblique, okay, uh, the double vision that they're seeing. Uh, and then the third part of that was the directionality. Are they seeing the double vision at near, at distance, in a certain gaze? So that really describes uh, um, uh, more detail about the double vision. But as you're asking those questions, you're breaking them down into your differential and the differential of horizontal diplopia versus vertical diplopia, and this is the list. So this part of the, the um, uh, talk, we're gonna talk about the cranial nerves, because I think it's important to, to, to know the pathway, to think about the pathway, um, and it, it engages you in terms of the diagnosis, but also what level of concern you should be in terms of their management. Last time we talked about super, super nuclear palsies. Now we're going to talk about the cranial nerve palsy. So let's start off with a third, okay? Because the third does so much. In terms of the muscles, these are all the muscles. The, uh, the cranial nerve three does the superior rectus, the levator, the medial rectus muscle, the inferior rectus muscle. Um, it does the inferior obliques. And it also does the levator, right? Um, and so uh, a dysfunction, a complete third, um, you really have ptosis and you have an eye that's out, just sitting out because the lateral rectus is the other dominant rectus that isn't affected, is pulling that eye down and out. Um, the most common cause is ischemia by far in terms of uh, event that's happening, but other things that should be concerning are hemorrhage, tumor infiltration, compression, and inflammation. And the most feared is the posterior communicating artery aneurysm. Okay, so you have to know that when you see a third and it's complete, you have to really think about, and pupil involved, and you have to really think about that um, and move urgently. Um, so really when you see a third nerve palsy, it's the pupil exam, and it's looking at the uh, ocular motility to really get an, a definition of how much of the third is involved. So I think it's really important to understand the pathway of the third. And so uh, as you think about, the, as we go through the pathway, you can start to think about, um, what, what are you seeing in terms of a third nerve palsy if it's partial versus complete and where the uh, lesion may be. Uh, so site one is, new, is, is the nucleus, right? And so it's really rare to have a nuclear, a, 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 a isolated nuclear uh, palsy, but it's worth mentioning. So it starts, uh, the third nerve starts at the level of the midbrain. And as you uh, exit, it exits ventrally uh, forward. Uh, the, the fascicle goes by the red nucleus um, and then it, it exits forward into the subarachnoid space. This is really important because so much happens. In the next slide, I'm going to talk about the um, uh, really important things to think about in terms of uh, uh, diagnosis um, for uh, its, its uh, involvement in the subarachnoid space. But it really goes between the posterior cerebellar um, uh, artery and the uh, superior cerebellar uh, artery, and, and it runs lateral to the posterior communicating artery. And this is where we're concerned, most concerned about posterior communicating artery aneurysm. And then it enters the cavernous sinus, okay? As we'll talk about what uh, the lesions can happen at the cavernous sinus uh, shortly. 
Um, and so, and then it goes into the orbit, and then the orbit actually it divides into a superior and inferior um, uh, division. So, so in the subarachnoid space, I put this slide because I think it's really worth talking about um, in terms of the most concerning is the posterior communicating artery aneurysm. You have to, that's going to be an isolated third with pupil involvement, but they also have a lot of other symptoms, their headaches. Uh, uh, are pretty severe uh, when they're having it. Um, it uh, uh, that's, that's a clear one that you need to know about. The reason why the pupil is involved is because the pupillary fibers sit on top of the, the, um, the, the cranial nerve three. And so any sort of compression or, or uh, aneurysm that's putting uh, pressure on it, you're gonna get pupil involvement. And that's why it's so sensitive uh, to that. The other ones that you need to know about also are um, uh, extradural hematomas uh, from trauma, uh, the herniation uh, that uh, 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 may occur affects at the level of the midbrain where the third nerve comes out into that subarachnoid space. So that's another uh, uh, thing that you need to be involved with. If there's a trauma related issue and you're seeing a third nerve palsy, um, you're, you're really concerned about he a, a, a hematoma or an extradural uh, hemorrhage. So, and then um, typically, this is also the area where you can get ischemic involvement, um, but it's typically sparing the uh, pupillary fibers which sit on top. Again, that's an important thing to understand. It sits on top uh, of the actual uh, uh, third uh, nerve. So again, function, because of all the muscles that involve is elevation, depression, adduction, uh, and eyelid retraction. Uh, so presentations typically can be double vision, but depending on the degree and involvement of the third nerve, you can have an oblique, uh, you can have vertical. You may not have double vision if the ptosis is down uh, because uh, that's actually covering the eye. And so they might have it until you lift that eye up, then they'll say, yeah, I'm having double. Uh, and uh, the most important thing when you assess a third nerve is to actually break it down. Take your time and break it down. First and foremost, is the pupil involved? Uh, is it sparing the pupil uh, um, and, or is it uh, involved? And that's a really key question. Now a common mistake that I, that I commonly see is that if you're, if you're fixating here straight ahead and this is the eye with the third nerve, what's gonna happen? It's gonna be down and out. And so the eye is over here. Um, and so if you're trying to figure out if it's pupil involving, this eye is looking at something else and this eye is looking at something else. And you may think that, that when you look at the pupils that, that the pupil is involved. So many times I have them turn their head so that the other eye meets the other eye where it's sitting. They still have double vision, but a little bit less. And, and then check the pupils. And you may see that it's not involving the pupil. Um, there's a lot of other information that you should be getting to put that together in terms of it being vascular, uh, because that's the most common cause is an ischemic cause. But that's a common mistake that I see many times with our trainees is that they'll put it right in front and this eye is looking over here. You're gonna get a pupillary difference because it's not fixating on the same, same object. So um, in terms of um, evaluation, again, complete, incomplete. I can't tell you that enough. Ptosis, gotta see if the pupil is involved. You have to rule out aneurysm, which is the emergency that you need to talk about. I'm sure that's, it's been mentioned many times, but it's the one that's missed most often. Uh, in terms of management, you want to get an MRA, uh, a CTA. Most CTA is good uh, to get. I think that's the most common one because CTA, you can, you can get a CTA pretty uh, um, emergently. Uh, MRA is sometimes much more complicated to get. If you have um, the capacity, um, uh, then the CTA can tell you everything you need to know. Um, uh, there are certain circumstances if you have a thrombus in the aneurysm that may not be picked up by the CTA and so you need that soft tissue information that you get um, with an MRA. Um, so in some places they do both if you have that capacity to do both but a CTA is, is actually um, uh, the first line and, and very good. Um, so it, again complete incomplete um, you want, if it's pupil sparing the most common cause is ischemia um, now, there, there has been some uh, huge discussion about whether you image or not image. Um, 
many times, if they have a strong vasculopathic history, diabetic, not well controlled, um, uh, vasculopathic and sort of peripheral vascular disease as well as cardiac disease, um, and uh, uh, it's most likely ischemic if it's pupil sparing, um, you can follow them uh, and not get imaging uh, emergently. Um, and, the, and, and it has to factor in the age too. They're usually uh, older than 50 and the, the vasculopathic older person um, that can fit the bill. Um, what, what, that's okay, you should follow them up. Now, what you see with the ischemic uh, third nerve palsy is that it gets better. So if they're misalignment, if they're down and out, pupils not involved, you should see in three months some improvement. Maybe not complete improvement, but you see, see improvement. If they come back and you don't see improvement, then you really need to think about imaging, okay? Now, other reasons uh, um, why you would need to image if they're young, they're under 50, if they're not vasculopathic, this seems atypical, you need to image. Um, if there's no microvascular disease, like I said, no uh, uh, um, uh, vasculopathic history, image them. Um, if there's concern for aberrant regeneration, which is a, um, uh, an event that happens when there's trauma or tumors, sometimes aneurysms, that can damage the third nerve and, it, and its ability to regenerate it, the regenerated axons are misdirected. And what actually happens is there's paradoxical innervation. So you can actually have um, what they call ocular motor synkinesis. So um, instead of, so things are miswired because of, uh, of the regeneration. And, and so you could have, the most common one is they could look up and then looking up the eyelid comes down or uh, elevation of the lid when uh, there's an attempted down gaze. Um, so they look down and the lid actually retracts. That's, a, that's, that's not how it normally works, right? Um, and so it's, that's a, that would be concerning for aberrant regeneration. Um, and then again, imaging, MRI, MRA, uh, if you're worried uh, really about an aneurysm. So I'm going to go uh, next to the next cranial nerve, which is the fourth nerve. Uh, the fourth nerve is very unique. It only goes to one muscle, so and that muscle is a superior oblique. You see, all the third goes to many muscles. This is this is only going to this one muscle. Okay, um, the, on presentation for a fourth nerve palsy, it's it, as soon as somebody describes a vertical or oblique double vision, you have to throw that into your differential. Okay, um, either via trauma, either decompensated fourth nerve um, uh, with something that was congenital, which they were compensating and they just now can't fuse it anymore and it's decompensated. Um, and, or uh, if there's some compression uh, or growth in the posterior fossa uh, region. So um, the fourth superior oblique, which is found medially and uh, superiorly, turns the eye inward and down. down so in towards the eye and depresses it. So if, if it's not working, that contralateral, the inferior oblique contra will take over, and so it sits up higher, okay? So you have hypertrophy of the eye that's affected with the fourth. And so what you do, because this eye is sitting up higher, the, you, you tilt your head to meet with the other eye to preserve binocular function. And that's why you'll see an, a contralateral head tilt with an isolated fourth nerve palsy. So unilaterally, if I have a right, I'll be tilting my head to the left. If I have a left, fourth, then I'll be tilting to my right. Okay, so it's a contralateral head tilt. Um, a fourth, you can imagine, they actually uh, have, it doesn't have as much, you, it's hard to sense the hyper, actually, uh, between the eyes, uh, but they hold the chin down position. Uh, and that's a little bit different because you have to use what we talked about last time, uh, uh, Maddox rods, uh, double Maddox rods, in which you can actually identify the torsion um, uh, and, and really measure the amount to get that diagnosis. Now, the most common reason actually for a fourth nerve is congenital. Um, so something, so congenital, they, they say congenital, but it could be something in the development early in life. It could sometimes be trauma early in life, but what happens 
uh, is that a, a person is misaligned, but the but but the um, but the brain actually is fusingly is actually able to fuse the images. Um, if it's misaligned significantly and it's fusing it and it's adapted to fuse it, it's been doing that. But if if it breaks down fusion for any reason, you're gonna have you're gonna have that vertical uh, diplopia. Um, but how you can distinguish congenital from acquired is that if they were fusing and they were misaligned, that means the ability for the for that brain to fuse vertically must have been greater than normal. And typically, um, we fuse a lot. So we fuse horizontally up to 30 prison diopters. Uh, and vertically, we fuse anywhere, and I've seen anywhere from one to three, but I've also seen three to five. So uh, anywhere from one to five, I would say we fuse vertically. The, these people can actually fuse much greater than that. And so if you can actually put, ask them to try to fuse that image uh, by putting um, a, a vertical uh, displacement, you'll actually be greater than that five or six. And that really gives you, um, uh, um, they have hot, large fusion, fusional amplitudes is what we call it. That really tells you that this is more of a congenital issue than an acquired issue. Uh, and the most common reason for an acquired issue is trauma. And, and the reason for that is, is to really understand the path, uh, the path that the fourth takes. Path is the, uh, the, the fourth nerve is the only one that, that exits from the midbrain dorsally. And so that's really important. So if you look here, uh, and this is the aqueduct here, um, and the fourth, you see that it actually goes out dorsally as opposed to ventrally, and then it crosses, it dexucates, and it crosses with each other. So a fourth uh, a, a, a damage, um, uh, so when you have a right fourth nerve palsy, potentially, could be, if it's at a nuclear or the fascicle, it could be on the contralateral side. Uh, and so that's really important to know. But if you look at the pathway, not only it crosses at the anterior vellum in the back, it, it then makes a long, long route all the way out in the subarachnoid space before it goes uh, into um, the cavernous sinus. And then eventually through the cavernous sinus goes into the orbit. But it's this long route that it takes that is uh, why trauma is, is one of the um, most important. So any hit to the back of the head, uh, coup, counter coup hit can also cause you to have uh, trauma and it's the most sensitive in that, in that, uh, in that uh, way. So um, now going back to the bedside, um, things you wanna look for if this is for. So they've now told you I have binocular, double vision, I'm seeing things that is, 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 is oblique, meaning I see it um, horizontal component and a vertical component. So it's, it's sitting like this as opposed to just pure horizontal or pure vertical. Um, uh, you have this in your differential. Uh, and so, um, uh, and, and what you'd be looking for when you look at them is are they having a head tilt in a certain direction when they look at you and talk to you, right? So um, these are three steps that I think are very useful uh, this, is, this is a three. This is a, with a classic three-step uh, test to really identify if they have a unilateral um, uh, fourth nerve palsy. And the first thing is is to identify if one of the eyes is sitting higher than the other. Remember, I told you the main function of the superior bleak um, uh, is to intort the eye. So if you have a trouble with with this eye, it's going to be sitting higher and out. Okay, um, and so. If you put that light in front of them and you see, hey, this one is fixating right on the light, but this one, it's nasal, um, it's sitting a bit lower, then you know, hey, I have a right hypertropia. So you've answered the first question in the step three. Um, and I think the next, um, next slide, I think, yeah, this, this is really good here. So here, um, for this case right here, you can see, He's tilting when he's looking at you. He's already tilting a little bit to, to the left, right? Um, but but when they're tilting their head, they may seem a little bit. They may see him aligned. So you really want to straighten their head because that's when you're really going to see the hypertropia. So if they, if, it, if you can't distinguish it and they're tilting their head, you want to change their head to a, to a straight position. When you straighten the head and you look at this, uh, you can see that this the reflex is sitting here, but you can see the highest, this right eye is sitting a little bit higher, right? So the next question you wanna ask is the, is the um, double vision worse 
in right or left gaze? These are questions you're going to ask to the patient. But what you're looking for is the hypertrophy increases on right or left gaze. So when this, when this patient looks to the right, you're not, you're not seeing any issue to the right. But on the left gaze, you can see that this right eye is actually uh, uh, going up higher uh, in adduction. Uh, and that we call that inferior oblique overaction. And it makes sense because the superior oblique, which is the, uh, the opposing muscle is not working, you're getting inferior oblique overaction. So the eye's shooting up, okay? Uh, for the eye that, that, that's being affected. So I can walk into a room, I can look at the eye, I can see that the one eye or straighten their head and can see the one eye sitting higher. Then I have them look right and left. And, and the eye that I'm already concerned about, which is the eye that's sitting up hyper, um, I'm having them look, and when they look in the left gaze, this eye is shooting up. I already know there's inferior oblique overaction. The right eye is higher. And the third question is the head tilt. But you already know that they have a contralateral head tilt. So you can imagine if it's, if it's turning left, they're compensating. If you turn it to the right, it's, it's harder for them. Like in this case, it's harder for him to bring it. It actually makes it worse, right? Because they can't bring that eye down. Um, and so. So usually the question is, you identify which eye is sitting uh, higher. The second question is, is the double vision worse in a particular gaze? And then the third question is, is the uh, double vision or the hypertropia worse um, in a, a particular head tilt? Is, and it should always be better in the contralateral, and it always should always be worse in, um, in, in the, the uh, ipsilateral side. All right, so then I'm going to move on to the sixth nerve. So the sixth nerve... Um, also innervates one muscle, okay? It's the lateral uh, rectus muscle. Um, dysfunction in the sixth nerve alone will cause you to have horizontal double vision, right? So going back to that chart where I broke up horizontal versus uh, vertical diplopia. So you already start thinking about your differential when you think about uh, um, horizontal uh, double vision. Um, and so uh, microvascular is the most common that, that we see with vascular uh, pathic history. Uh, elevated intracranial pressure, a false localizing um, uh, sign is a sixth nerve palsy. And we'll talk about a little bit why that is. Uh, mass effect in the pontine region. Now, the most important thing, the first two that we talked about, the third and the fourth, are coming from the midbrain, right? And the midbrain is sort of in parallel to where it's, it's trying to get into the cavernous sinus. The sixth is, is in the pontine. So it actually has to come out has to come out and actually go up uh, to get into the cavernous sinus. So that's a very important thing because it has to go upward. And so because of that upward movement up to go into the cavernous sinus, it is more sensitive to um, uh, vertical movements and more sensitive to elevated intracranial pressure, which would affect those vertical movements. Um, uh, and so um, uh, it's, uh, that's why with high pressure, where you get sort of cranial cervical shifts, um, uh, it is more sensitive. And that's why you may see a sixth nerve, either unilateral or bilateral. Okay. So again, um, following it, it it's, it's, it's a pontine. So pontine, any pontine diseases would affect the nucleus, but it comes out, it, um, the fascicle uh, comes, it exits ventrally. It has to go up here, like it's going up, up the, uh, value in the superior in the uh, subarachnoid space, it's going superior. So it's a vertical shift versus a, just a parallel shift that you see with the third and fourth. And then um, it actually um, goes by the petroclinoid uh, ligament, and then goes forward into the cavernous sinus, and then goes into the orbit where it goes to the lateral rectus. So. Um, when you see an isolated uh, sixth nerve uh, palsy, um, when you see a young patient, um, you really want to talk about is this uh, elevated intracranial pressure. So this is where we had uh, previously just was talking earlier about afferent, efferent. It's really important to look at the optic nerves um, and to really get an idea if, if there's any swelling or any signs of elevated intracranial pressure that can affect uh, what you would see a bilateral optic nerve edema. Um, Neoplasm uh, in the orbit, uh, where you're worried about young uh, uh, patients, uh, and really high ICP is the main one. The, in young patients, when you've ruled out high ICP, you see normal uh, optic nerves, uh, 
the second most common thing that I see in young patients is a, is a post-viral issue. So they'll give me a history where they had an acute onset, fever, and then there's a decompensation where they're having double vision. Um, and so I usually wait and give them time to recover. And uh, most of them recover um, uh, and, and they get back to fusing. But there's a clear limitation. And again, it goes back to doing your eye exam because if they're not bearing the sclera, they can't go all the way out. That's, that's, uh, that tells you that that six is not working. So they're actually esotropia. The other thing we talked about last time, I'm gonna repeat it because I think it's really important. At the bedside, they might say, they might talk to you about having intermittent double vision, horizontal vision. Uh, and that may be because when you do a near card and you look up close and they're looking at you close, they're converging their eyes. So you're not, you're straight, you're fine to them. But, but when you ask them to look at a distance, they can't bring that because the, the lateral rectus is not working. They can't bring that eye out to fixate on the target. So they'll have double vision that's worse at distance, but improves or may be asymptomatic at near. So that's, that goes back to that third question about directionality, okay? Uh, so, when, so the first question would be, do you have binocular double vision? Second question would be, yes, I see it, it's horizontal. And then the third question is, is it better near or resolves when it's near? Is it worse at distance? Because that gets at, that gets at um, uh, you'd be thinking about the sixth nerve uh, palsy. Um, older patients, the most common reason is ischemic um, mononeuropathy. I've seen this quite often. Um, you really want to check their blood pressure. You want to check if they they're, um, have optimal glycemic control. Um, you know, lab works that we send out at that time, um, CBC and uh, hemoglobin A1C. Um, you want to also um, um, check and not forget for any of the ones that we've talked about, um, you want to check uh, for uh, giant cell arteritis, okay? Uh, and so that's the uh, ESR, CRP. Um, if there's concern about from their sexual history about syphilis, um, that's something you may want to ask too. And if there are any signs of any autoimmune diseases, uh, you can do that workup as well. Uh, again, age under 50, you get an MRI um, uh, to figure out why, why this is happening, uh, especially if it's not trauma. Uh, I mean, even with trauma, you're going to get you're imaging, but um, under 50, you're going to get imaging for a uh, for sixth nerve. Um, over 50, um, if it's um, uh, it, it, there's strong vasculopathic history, likely to be ischemic. But again, like the third, any of these uh, mono neuropathies, they should get better um, uh, after three months. They should be improvements. So if they, if they have a sixth nerve palsy, what's going to happen? right? It's going to be esotropia. And if they're esotropin, you may use prism diopters and it's, it's 30. They should, next time you see them, they should get to 15 or 20, or 20. They should be improving. But if they're 30 and they're still 30, if uh, you want to image that. And if they get worse, you definitely want to image that. Um, and I think that's what I get at this. Um, so when you see now, you're going to treat the underlying cause, whatever it is, aneurysm, neoplasm, microvascular issue, inflammatory issue, infectious. You're going to get to that and treat it. But now, they're, now you know that they have this cranial nerve palsy. You've taken care of their issue. There's misalignment. What do you, how do you treat this? How do you, how do you um, uh, um, follow these patients? And um, I usually give them six months um, to give optimal recovery of that cranial nerve um, at a time. So if you have a six nerve palsy, uh, you know, uh, and it's debilitating, you can patch one eye. Um, sometimes you can get glasses and I, I take the cello tape and you can put it behind one of the lenses and that's better and they can walk around so nobody sees them with the patch over one eye and they can be much more functional. Um, that, that's an option um, you, and that's like a fogging of the lens. Um, so you want to give them six months, okay? This is not, I'm not talking about the underlying cause. You've already treated that. Now that they have a, a, a strabismus, a misalignment, and they have double vision, I'm talking about how do you manage them. Um, I give them, I don't go any sooner. I don't go to where, the answer is not to jump to surgery, um, uh, uh, but you give them time. You can help sometimes and give them some prison correction. I don't tend to do that. I tend to wait the six months. And then at six months where they are, 
um, is typically where they're going to be. So I want to give them uh, then prisms if it's just a small misalignment, if I can correct that. If I can't, then I do strabismus surgery uh, to uh, correct them. Uh, but you want to give it time because the, the worst thing you would do if you do surgery after three months is that it, it actually, you've corrected it so it's straight and then it's still healing, it may go out, right? So you want to give it the full capacity to recover. And I've definitely seen patients at three or four months with, with double vision, but at six months go away. So I, I really would wait that six months. So um, now when you start to see, we talked about individual each cranial nerve, but when you start to see multiple cranial nerves, you got to think about what location. And the, the main things, main areas you want to look at are the spinocavernous um, sort of region. Uh, so uh, cavernous sinus syndrome, uh, then as it exits, it goes to superior orbital fissure and the orbital apex, okay? Um, the most important thing, and I've highlighted it here, um, uh, when you follow, so you can see in the cavernous sinus that you have the third, the fourth, um, and uh, the, the sixth floating uh, closest to the uh, uh, carotid um, uh, there and uh, the internal carotid. But you also want to know that V1 and V2 are, are present. Um, and so I, I think that's extremely important because if you see V1 and V2, it's particularly V2 uh, involved, it's putting it into the cavernous sinus. As you go through your cranial nerve exam, and you say, okay, three is involved, four is involved, and, and you may not see all of them involved. You may see the sixth initially um, uh, um, is quite commonly sensitive, but you may see partial of, of several things. But when you see multiple cranial nerves, you got to start thinking about cavernous sinus. And in particular, um, you want to check V2, because V2 tells you it's more in the cavernous sinus versus um, sort of uh, the superorbital fissure type syndrome uh, because the V2 gets out of that uh, location, okay? So the V2, I can't tell you how important that is in terms of figuring out if it's, if it's at that juncture involving the cranial, uh, involving the cavernous uh, sinus. Uh, and these are some etiologies. Uh, these are, uh, when you think about cavernous sinus, vascular tumor uh, infection, um, so uh, vascular lesions, uh, aneurysms of the internal carotid uh, artery, um, uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis, uh, CC fistula, if there's a history of uh, if they're older or if they have a um, uh, fast flow you see after trauma. Uh, tumors, uh, any of the tumors right sitting at that uh, chiasmal region, you'd be concerned, especially when they uh, start to grow uh, significantly. Infections, which uh, you got, uh, are well on your differential for syphilis and tuberculosis. Um, and inflammation, I think, ischemia, you're well of an uh, inflammation um, like lupus. I tend to see a little bit more lupus in children uh, here. Um, and to also Hunt syndrome. Um, so I'm going to now switch gears to, to orbital causes of double vision. And this is really important because when you think about orbital causes, um, I think the most important thing is to think about the structure of the muscles here. And if you look at this, this looks like a cone. You see this cone that's here, and this is the eye. So when you think about orbital causes that may be affecting um, and causing double vision, you want to know if it's axial versus non-axial, okay? And axial means it's within the cone, uh, and non-axial means it's not within the cone, okay? So when you're axial and something's growing within that cone, it pushes the eye forward, so you get proptosis. So axial and non-axial. And when you get non-axial issues, it, it, can start to, um, uh, it can start to shift the eye. So when you have what they call dystopia, which is the eye being shifted in or out, or being pushed in a particular direction, and you're seeing a hard stopping going in the opposite direction, um, and that facial asymmetry, the ocular asymmetry, which we call dystopia, um, that's more concerning for non-axial. But the proptosis, which you see, uh, and I'm sure um, optic nerve glioma is a clear one, where significant behind the eye pushing it forward uh, is an axial. Uh, and so that helps you at the bedside to distinguish and start to think about differential. So axial things that we think about, this is a list uh, of common things. So cavernous hemangioma, uh, meningiomas, uh, which uh, um, uh, can definitely uh, cause that eye to be proptotic 
glioma we talked about, thyroid orbitopathy, uh, lymphangioma, excuse me, and orbital inflammatory syndrome, which, is, which mirrors the thyroid orbitopathy in terms of inflammation, and it's just push, pushing it forward. Uh, the um, thyroid orbitopathy is actually the, the fibrosis of the muscles, which are pushing it forward. So this is non-axial reason. So things that would shift, it's just have to know the anatomy. Uh, uh, and so uh, the eye sits in the orbit, so it's housed, you know, and there's a floor, um, and there's a roof, and then there's the medial and lateral wall. So if you think about what things would potentially grow and push into the orbit, uh, really um, uh, it shapes your differential. So things uh, that would shift it up, obviously, are stuff that grows from the maxillary sinus and pushes that eye upward. Uh, things that shift it down are things that are coming from superiorly pushing it down. So neuroblastoma, uh, more common in younger patients that I see, but any schwannomas, dermoid, uh, tumors of the uh, lacrimal gland, so pleomorphic adenoma, adeno, uh, adenoid cystic cancer, and capillary hemangiomas can shift that eye down. Um, they can also, because of the direction of the lacrimal gland, they can also be shifted uh, more medially. And so that these are pretty similar on this list and this list. Sphenoid wing meningioma would also shift that eye more medially. And now laterally, you're thinking about more um, things found medially that's shifting it this way. So ethmoid sinus tumors, uh, basal cell car uh, um, uh, cancers, uh, lacrimal sac. So this is down here where the lacrimal sac is because you make tears up here and you drain them down here, right, by the lacrimal duct. Uh, and abscesses and uh, metastatic disease. So uh, I'm going to go over just a few co most common causes for double vision. So I think it's really, you know, things that should be on your... Thyroid eye disease, right? So restricted myopathy. It's dysthyroid. So it could be hypo or hyperthyroid that can cause it. So they have a history of that or family history. You're, you're thinking about uh, autoimmune issues um, uh, uh, and, uh, and including the uh, ocular myasthenia, which is it's going to be on the next slide. Um, and um, the thing to think that you get imaging, uh, CT scan is great. Um, it can tell you what you need to know in terms of thickening of the muscles and their fibrosis of the muscles. They tend to affect, uh, and uh, we have this uh, acronym, which I think it's an I am slow, uh, inferior, medial, uh, tend to be affected more than uh, superior lateral rectus, and then the obliques are the last to be affected. Um, things to know about thyroid uh, eye disease because of the congestion that they get their double vision can sometimes be diurnal. And so that goes back to the question I said, direction. When does it happen? When is it most, uh, when does it occur? Well, you know, thyroid people have double vision in the morning. You know, they tend to have double vision more in the morning. They say my symptoms get better throughout the day. And the reason for that is it's the congestion that they have in their orbit as they're sleeping. Uh, so many times we ask thyroid, uh, people with thyroid eye history who get that double vision in the, in the morning, to put a couple pillows uh, so that they're popped upright, and that tends to help with their double vision, and because it has to do with orbital congestion uh, that they get throughout the night. Um, forced ductions, we talked about that last time in our uh, discussion of things that we can do in our eye exam. Um, so forced duction is something that ophthalmologists tend to do. So we put we numb the eye, uh, and then we we actually grab the eye because it's numb. That's why we can do it and we can move the eye. And when, there's, when, the, when the muscles are tight and they're hard to move, um, you can feel it because they, sh they should move really easily, okay? Um, we, tend not, we tend to do that under sedation most of the time, for kids definitely. For adults, if they're a very cooperative adult, um, we tend to use a Q-tip after we've numbed the surface of the eye to, to sort of get an idea as we're pushing it, to have them look right and left to see if there's tightness. Um, but it's, it's quite uh, hard to get forceps to grab the eye and, and, and um, have adults, they have to be very cooperative to do it. Orbital myositis, uh, this is inflammation uh, that affects the muscles. They can be inflamed idiopathically, but can be inflamed by infection uh, and uh, inflammatory disease. So you want to rule those out. Um, uh, um, and so uh, do their double vision uh, what they call it, we call them periorbital signs. They'll, they'll be very painful double vision, so they'll tell you about it. They'll have positive force 
abductions as well, which is uh, the restrictions found in the muscle. Um, once you've ruled out any other of those etiologic uh, um, causes in terms of uh, infection has been ruled out um, uh, and it's just isolated inflammation, you want to give uh, steroids. And uh, they sometimes have to be on steroids for a long time. Uh, if you take them off too quickly, they rebound. And that's very, that's very clear uh, with idiopathic uh, orbital myositis. Um, double vision from trauma. So if you get a blower hit to the face um, and um, you actually have uh, uh, inferior floor fracture here, um, you can entrap the inferior rectus. And this is an example where if you look on the contralateral eye, you can see where the inferior rectus is just sitting um, uh, on that uh, floor uh, uh, of the, um, the, the inferior floor uh, here. When there's a fracture and there's a little gap there, it's pinched the muscle and the muscle is pinched and stuck, and they, they sometimes call this, a, a, in children they call it a, a, a green stick fracture, you know, it's similar, it pinches the, um, the muscle. Um, usually in adults where the, where the bone is more brittle, um, it turns to be more of a blowout, so that it's more common that these injuries happen in kids. Uh, they'll get a, they'll, because the inferior rectus is, a, is pinched, um, it can uh, cause, the, it can really, uh, um, damage the inferior rectus, uh, it can cause limitation in the eye movements, and you get a really painful double vision. And with the attempts of looking up, they can feel sick and, uh, and feel vomiting, nausea and vomiting. Um, in children, they sometimes may not feel anything, and we call that a white blowout, um, uh, a white eye uh, blowout uh, fracture. Um, so but the, but the muscle being entrapped can be extremely painful and uh, uh, in adults. Um, just to, to put into orbital causes for double vision, uh, infiltrative disease, so that could be neoplastic um, uh, disease or metastatic disease, um, and so um, uh, you want to put that in your differential. So there's any history of, of cancers or tumors or there's family history of any genetic uh, uh, reasons for why they may have um, uh, high risk of developing neoplasm. Uh, you need to take that information. Um, and uh, usually that's painless, but they'll talk about a gradual uh, diplopia. Um, they will also have restrictions. So you can imagine trying to move this muscle. It's, you're, you're trying to move that muscle through jello. So it, it's, it, it feels restricted. Um, myasthenia, I think I'll talk to you about more about myasthenia, but that's always in your grab bag. When you've really ruled out a lot of different things, um, uh, and you get the history of it be, uh, if their double vision is fatigued, that they're aligned, but you, you could fatigue them or it's worse at the end of the day and it's, and it's clearly double. Um, uh, those are um, things that are really concerning for double vision. Uh, that, and, and double vision caused by myasthenia gravis. And myasthenia gravis, 90% of the time is an autoimmune disease. So if they have a history of autoimmune uh, um, uh, disease in their family, and most commonly thyroid, uh, you want to get that information. That would lead you down this path to start to think about um, myasthenia, uh, especially after doing a complete workup. Um, and uh, the fatigue is the main key, and we'll talk more about that in, in another talk. Um, and then you can't never, you can, you should never forget this, double vision. We usually think of uh, vision loss uh, with giant star arteritis, uh, um, but double vision is right up there. So if you have somebody um, older than you know 50, I know it says 60 here, but I was older than 50, um, you want to check an ESR and CRP, okay? Uh, and you need to rule that out um, because that can tell you that's, that is missed quite commonly. So you need to check both of those things um, you could, if you miss that and you let it go, the worst case, the, 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 the worst case scenario is to allow it to take its natural course, which is then to cause permanent vision loss, um, uh, when it affects the optic nerve, but you really need to identify double vision is one of the reasons, uh, that you need to, to do an ESR, CRP, and platelet uh, test. Uh, treatment for this is steroids. There are newer treatments out, um, which are immune modulators, uh, that you can also treat. Um, uh, giant cell arteritis. This goes, these are my last two slides, so I think I'm, I'm done. <laughs> uh, I know I'm a little over, um, but I, uh, 
this was brought up last time, uh, Dr. Kotari. I think you were talking about monoc double vision after cataract surgery. And so these are um, reasons here on the slide for monocular double vision. So it's so important that first question, and I'm gonna go back to it. When you ask, are you getting double vision with one eye or both eyes, that they, that they cover both eyes. Because you can imagine if they had one eye, they had cataract surgery, and this eye right here is causing them double vision, and they cover that eye, and they say, oh no, it's gone, um, uh, versus covering this eye, say no, I still have it, you would go down the pathway of binocular double vision. And I, I can't tell you, how easy it is that right off the first to get to go down the right pathway uh, in your differential. So these are reasons why you have double vision after cataract surgery um, and uh, when things haven't worked out optimally. Um, so one is that obviously you can see the lens that should be centered is decentered. So what they're getting is refractive error changes along this edge and they're not, they're getting double vision symptoms. Um, another issue is that if you've cracked the lens as you placed it and there's a crack in the lens, um, that can actually cause you to have this double vision a refractive error. Um, this, a year after having cataract, I wouldn't say a year, but six months to a year after having cataract surgery, um, there can be some um, extra tissue growth um, around the lens. We call this posterior capsular opacity. So they might start to have double vision-like symptoms. They, they might say that my vision is not as sharp anymore. And this is something where ophthalmologists, him or her, can take a laser and just laser at the level of the lens this tissue off, and it gets clear again. Like uh, It's like cleaning the window, so it just clears it up, and they say their symptoms are gone. Um, for concerns for a narrow... And, um, uh, anatomically narrow angle or a shallow um, anterior chamber, um, some people can get, um, uh, they, can, they can put another, what they call um, iridectomy or uh, uh, periodotomy, which is a hole that they put on the iris. And the reason for that is to help the flow uh, because of the concern of it being a shallow anterior chamber. This sometimes can cause people to feel because the light coming in is not only coming through the pupil, but now you've created an opening, which is for the flow within the eye, but light can, if it's large, can cause light to come in from the top. And they will say that they have also have a double vision issue. Now, these are reasons for double vision after cataract surgery in one eye. But I wanna point out these two reasons why you may get um, uh, double vision that, um, can uh, be binocular. So what they commonly do is they put a retrobulbar injection, and this injection goes back here and it numbs up all the nerves. This is what they do right before the cataract surgery. So you can't move your eye. So you're still for me, and I can actually do the cataract. I can put my instruments in while you're awake and take out your natural lens and put an artificial lens in. Um, this is anesthetic, it's just numbing it and it wears off, right? Um, this going can cause damage if it's not done correctly. And if it's not put in the right angle, it can actually go through the muscle and can cause an inferior rectus damage. So that would cause you to have misalignment that's double, okay? So th these are reasons why they may have double vision that's not monocular, not related to the eye, but related to damage to the muscle or the nerve uh, if the needle goes too far back. Um, I'm gonna stop there probably talked too much um, and uh, I'm open to any questions that you guys have. Yeah, hello, Danny. Yeah. Yeah, we have 14 questions. 14, okay. The first question is, okay. Uh, do we image pupil sparing third palsy? Do That's we image yeah. pupil sparing? Um, Do we image? Uh, I think it, it, um, it depends, right? So uh, uh, I talked about earlier about the age, uh, about the history, uh, and anything that sounds atypical, you go ahead and image. Now, if it's a young age, you want to go ahead and image. But if it's, if it's pupil sparing, pupil sparing third, 
you're okay with holding off if they have strong vascular pathic history um, and, um, uh, and, and that's it. It's an isolated finding and it's pupil sparing. Cause, uh, so you, as long as they have good vascular, uh, I mean, they have vasculopathic history, I think you're fine with holding off. But I remember I mentioned, I would, I would follow them up in six to eight weeks. And if you don't see improvement in their alignment, if things aren't, if their double vision is not getting better. And what I mean by, when I ask that question, is double vision getting better? You might, they might get puzzled. But what, you, what you're talking about, double vision getting better, is that things get closer together, right? Because they, they'll say, no, I still have double vision. Well, that's fine. But it was this far apart before, which is really bad. But it's now closer. Are you seeing improvement in, in the double vision is what, what you want to ask. And if you do, then you're okay with following still. But if, um, but if it's atypical and it's not getting better after three months, uh, you need to image. And again, if you're younger uh, and you're not vasculopathic and there are other findings, um, and other symptoms, you need to image. Um, Vira, would uh, the fact that suppose somebody has a partial third nerve palsy and then his pupil is spared, that doesn't qualify as a sparing, uh, pupil sparing. But if it's a total third nerve and yet pupil is spared, then you can call it a pupil sparing. That's right. That's right. If you have, if you have, if you have, um, like I had mentioned in the pathway, if the third nerve splits in the orbit and you get, um, uh, sup let's say, a superior rectus and a ptosis, but the movement, for adduction and inferior is intact, then you're really thinking location-wise it's in the orbit. You need to get it, you need to get, you need to image that. Yeah, even even, if even when the pupil is spared, right? Yeah, even if spared the pupil are spared, it's always better to image. I think even conditions yeah. like Tolosa Hunt syndrome and all. Mm -hmm. the pupils are usually spared. Yeah, right. Even you can always get more information on imaging on MRI. Yeah. I, I, if you if you have the capacity to image, I would always image. <laughs> yeah, I think we're we're not not the same. But if you if you don't have that and it's limited in any capacity, um, uh, a, a, a uh, and it's not following a complete pupil sparing. If there's any concern that it's inferior superior division uh, when you look at and it's orbital, in your case. You're getting a telosa hunt is what extremely painful periorbital signs, right? Um, it's more than than just the third nerve. Then you, you need to image. I agree. Yeah, there are some things in diplopia which neurologists do not understand. One is the use of these prisms. Could you explain these prisms a bit for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can take it back to the one of the earlier slides. Um, uh, so the prism bends the light, uh, bends the image, the incoming image. So oop, like this. So if the eye is misaligned, uh, I have a, I have a six nerve palsy. My eye is over here. My other eye can move in all directions, but my one eye is over here. So when I look straight, the image, the, the image is doubled because the macular part, the part that's fixating, right? When you read a book, read a book here. You don't read it out here, right? Because the sharp vision's in the center. High resolution vision is in the center. So if the high resolution, if your macular vision is right in the center of my palm, right? And it's stuck over here, and this one's over here, then I'm seeing, I'm seeing double. But if I put a prism, and what you use is the base. So if you, if this, um, um, if this, you want to bring this eye out, let's say, you can put the base in this direction. It brings the incoming image and it bends it so that it, it, it's, it's falling in line with the eye that's not affected. So as you put the prism, it should be shifting the image over until it fuses. If you go too far, it actually goes, you'll get double again, right? So, so the prism is actually bringing the incoming is, uh, image to the eye. It's, it's actually refractively bending it, bending the image so that it falls onto the macula, which is this area right here. So that way you can say, if this is 45 prism diopter, there's a 45 prism diopter deviation, okay? And this can be, so if this was, 
if this was half this, if I had cut this the prism here, maybe that's that's a smaller prism. So that's 25 or 20, right? But there's still that may bring that e to here, not all the way over. And so the 40 brings it all to where it's fusing the image to a single image. So it's taking this and bringing it over so that it falls in line. So the prism is used to bring to bend the incoming image so that it falls on the macula. Um, and, and, and when it does fall on the macula, it's fusing. They no longer have double. So with the prism in front of their eyes, their double is gone. If it's the, if it's the correct amount of deviation, right? Does that, does that help? Yeah. yeah. Does that clarify? Okay. What is, what is the meaning? What is the meaning of this base in and base out prisms? How, do, how does it differ? Which conditions you use base out? Which condition you use base in prisms? Yeah, so, so, so that's, a great, that's a great question. So I think for, um, for ease, I will tell you a trick, a, a, a ease of understanding. I think it, 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 if, if your eye is like this and this eye is inward, right? Um, the base, you, you want this eye to come out technically, right? All right, or and you want to make the image so it falls in line. So you usually put a base out to bring this eye out, right, in front of it. So the base is, the image is falling, it, it is bending the light in the direction of the apex. So, so the direction you put the prism is very important, okay? Because if I put this, this is base out at the moment for this eye. But if I flipped it so that the base is in and the apex is here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually um, take the image, instead of bringing it here, it's going to bring it further away. Does that make sense? So, so it's really, it's, sorry, it's really important that if you know that the eye is inward like this, you want to base out to bring that eye out because you want to bring the image over. So, but if you bring it in, you're actually moving the image further away. So your double vision is going to get worse. Okay. So the direction of a horizontal for, this is a horizontal, but you can also do the same thing vertical. All right. So I like to think so of it. The, so, yeah, so to summarize it, if you there is an isotropia, you use base out prisms, is it? That's right. Exotropia, you exotropia, you use base in prisms, is it? That's right, because it's eye. You want the eye to come in. So put the base in the direction you want the eye to go to. I think it's the best way to think about it. Okay. So if it's hypertropia, you use the base down prism, is it? That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. Thank yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, Danny. Danny, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, then the other questions. Uh, somebody asked, asked me, please explain diplopia charting, how to interpret it. Um, the, oh, the diplopia, um, the chart on how they actually draw the, the pictures. Um, so, yeah. That you have to do with the red uh, Maddox rod, I think, or red glass, and whenever that's exactly right. Maximum, that is that is the action of that is the weakness. Yeah. So, do you see these pictures? You see this 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 chart. This person is looking in each direction, right? And so, when you um, see the um, actual chart, now take all the images out. You see the white line, right? This is the chart that you see, right? You see, you just see a cross section like this, right? And they're writing in numbers in those in those areas, right? Is that right? That's the, what you mean by the charting. So, so what you're doing is you're checking the misalignment here, and this is a line. So you would just say ortho here, okay? Um, but if this eye was deviated, you would actually write the prism diopter. The numbers are talking about the number of deviation, and higher the number, higher the deviation. So X team. XT means exotropia, ET means esotropia. Um, so I crossing in, ESO, XO out, and then the number of diopters means the thickness of the prism, right? So that's un okay. universal. That unit is the same uh, in terms of how much uh, light that it's bending. Um, so when you okay. see a chart like this, and you see numbers written here, and a number written here, and a number written here, they're referring to the, to the different gazes how much they're measuring the um, uh, the misalignment. So this child right here, 
her eye is, is dilated in this right eye, okay? Um, and her eye is a little bit out in this eye. When I have her look up, right, yeah. no, she I has... We can't see us. Uh, uh, we, are, we are seeing uh, Dr. Uh, Danny's, uh, Dananjit. Oh, okay. Dananjit. Sorry. Uh, uh, Danny, you can uh, stop sharing your screen. Should I stop okay. it? So, should I start sharing mine or can you see my screen or no? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you yeah, not, we can't see it right now. Okay. Yeah, now we can. Yes. Okay. So, this, uh, this screen right here, um, usually when you say charting, usually how you would chart this is that you, I think the most important thing is to get primary. Because in this case, primary, you can see that this eye is sitting out. So if you put a light here, she'll fixate with this eye, but this eye is sitting out. So you're gonna measure how much is that eye sitting out. But what people do for a third nerve, when she looks up, the alignment is great because this eye can't go up. When she looks over to the side, she really has no double vision, so it's ortho. But when she looks over here, this eye can't adduct, right? So this left eye, this uh, right eye, excuse me, um, is sitting out, can't adduct. So the number here, if you can't adduct, that means it's sitting out. So you have an exotropia in that gaze, right? So when, when people chart it, they chart it in terms of um, this uh, sort of, if you take these blue lines, the right numbers here, the one in the center is the primary. The one in each of this is the right and left gaze. And the one up here, the up and down below, are the superior and inferior gaze. And that's how they chart it. But the most important one is primary, actually. Because if you tell me a child comes in uh, and you talk about the motility, there's superduction deficit, adduction deficit, infraduction deficit. And in primary, you're showing me an exotropia of that eye that's pupil involving. I, we know that's a third nerve. So it's really the primary, which is the, the key one that you want to write more than anything when it comes down to bedside. Uh, and I'm, and I'm giving you what you want to do on the bedside acute situation. Okay. Uh, uh, Viral, you can stop sharing your screen so Danny will get his uh, questions in. Sure. Stop. How do I stop? <laughs> uh, at, the top. at the top, there is stop sharing. I got it. I got it. There he goes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Danny. Danny's got frozen. Uh, till then, I'll ask a question. Some, uh, 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 double vision with monocular. Do you get two separate images, or are they just overlapping like a ghost image? Can you get two uh, separate images? Can you get two separate images? Uh, um, you can. You can. Um, so typically, it's mainly uh, refractive and service. Typically, it's the ghost image is what you get. It really is, okay? Um, if you get retina issues, it can seem more of a double vision. And there are certain lens issues where refractively, they feel like two. But usually with the corneal issues, um, it's primarily just that ghost image, like you said, you know? Like, and it's a ghost effect. Is this exactly what it is, you know, this line? When you ask them to break it down, that's exactly what they deserve. They feel like there's a bubble line behind around them. The pinhole, uh, is there, I mean, we don't have the proper official pinhole that you have, but what if you take just some uh, visiting card and poke a hole through it? Yeah, and it that's the perfect. Thing. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah, anytime uh, when we're rounding, nobody has the equipment sometimes. We just, I'll just get a card and just pop a little, bit, like a, uh, we get a paper clip. Boom, 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 and have them look through it. The same, ref, uh, the refractive, it's changing, it's bringing, it's consolidating that image and it's refractively bringing it closer. Um, and, and that's the effect. And it tells you it's a refractive error issue. So. Okay, Danny, go ahead. Yeah. Just a minute. Huh? Uh, so there was a question regarding non-invasive radiology. Uh, in giant cell arteritis, how reliable it is? Um, so like ultrasound, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Um, you know, it's, um, 
the, you know, actually, I think it, it really depends on your, your ultrasound machine. <laughs> um, uh, I've been more impressed by the more recent papers, which have actually shown when you have a very good ultrasound uh, machine, it actually it can be quite compelling. Uh, some uh, uh, and some of the most recent um, uh, at Nanos or neuro ophthalmology meeting, um, people gave some really great examples of how useful it can be. Um, I, I at the end of the day, uh, I think you still stick to your guns in terms of ESR, ESR CRP. And clinically, if there's a high, um, it doesn't matter, right? Um, uh, even if the biopsies are negative, which I, and I, I used to do the biopsies, you know, so um, uh, I mean, I would do them myself. So I would get that temporary biopsy and, and take it. And if it's negative on both, but there's clear signs of it uh, in terms of testing and, and, and that, we, we continue with the steroids. Um, so I, I do think there is some bet. I think it went to, to shine clarity on. It, I do think they are useful. If you have a good ultrasound machine, I think it's useful. Yeah. Uh, can you see my, uh, the PowerPoint now? Those questions. Yeah, I can. I can, I can see. Yeah. Can. Okay. So few you already answered. Uh, yeah. Can small vessel vasculitis involve fascicle, fascicle of third nerve? Right. Yes. Okay. Small, small. Yes, it's rare, but it can happen. Yeah. Then I think you answered a couple of questions in your talk already. Functional okay. general anatomy of third nerve subnucleus. Somebody wanted to know in detail about third nerve subnucleus. Oh, okay. I originally had that in my talk. I don't know. Uh, um, so it's, it's very interesting because when you look at the anatomy of it, um, if you, if you, um, the superior rectus and the levator have a single nuclei. It's bilobed and it's single. So you can actually have, though it's rare, you can actually have a lesion, one lesion, which can cause you to have bilateral um, ptosis as well as superior rectus issues, um, uh, just the way that it's uh, organized. Uh, superior to the nucleus uh, is the um, pupillary fibers that enter West ball nuclei, which sits right on top of it. Okay, um, but um, the unique uh, um, subnuclei, which is really interesting, is that the levator and the superior rectus are are very much so in the midline, and one single lesion can actually cause you to have bilateral presentation of it. Um, otherwise, the super the, the the other subnuclei are lateral and they're ipsilateral. Uh, in location, in terms of the medial rectus, inferior rectus, uh, and uh, inferior oblique. Yeah, to summarize that, if uh, third nerve nuclear palsy occurs, ptosis will be bilateral, superior mm -hmm. rectus weakness will be bilateral, pupillary mm -hmm. involvement also it has to be bilateral. Yeah. Right. right. So, is there any role of steroids in isolated third or sixth nerve palsy? Um, for isolated. Um, yeah, you know, you, you, it, 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 that's a really funny question because if they're vasculopathic and they have diabetes, it's not good, right? <laughs> it's not helpful. So it's um, idiopathic. It's on, in idiopathic where you don't have any cause for that. Oh, excuse and me. I misunderstood the question. Oh, it's not isolated. So it, it, idiopathic, you're saying. Um, yeah. I mean, you could, as long as you've ruled out everything and say, like you said, it's idiopathic. It wouldn't hurt, and I and I have put them on low doses. The question is, did it recover on its own, or did it was it the steroid that I put them on? And that's I, I think that's a question that's hard to get to. I put them on, I put kids on um, with viral etiologies, which we're going to presume it's viral because everything else is negative and there's no elevated intracranial pressure and they have normal normal neuroimaging. Um, why do you have a six nerve palsy? It's clear it's a six. It's not ocular myasthenia. It's clear six. It's constant, right? It just happened. Um, they give a remote history of a viral issue. I can't tell. Uh, I go ahead and put them on steroids for that. As long as I've ruled out any, the most important thing is you ruled out any infectious etiology before you do that. So. Um, sometimes I've seen patients given steroid, they improve, and then uh, the person feels a false sense of security and later comes back with uh, myasthenia after a couple of uh, weeks or months. Yeah. So uh, 
I would be wary of using steroid unless you really uh, feel that it is some inflammatory thing. Because as you said, whether the person is improving spontaneously or because of the steroid, you will never know. And uh, there is no evidence that it uh, helps improve uh, faster. Yeah. 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 Unless you think it's inflammatory. The ocular myasthenia, um, they have to, I, I think, um, I, I mean, I would agree if, if they've had their double vision for a long time and unclear etiology, then you're thinking that it may be a, uh, it, and myasthenia is a concern in that case, um, on your differential for miscellaneous, um, then I would, um, I understand that completely. And you can also, the, the danger of that is that you can put them into crisis if you just give them steroids for that. But idiopathic in the sense that they're not giving you a history and it's sort of acutely happened, because myasthenia rarely will come in with an acute constant like that, right? So it's, it's about the, the details of the, the, uh, of the story. Um, um, but I agree with you that if they come in with a long standing and just to give them steroid, that's not the case. But if, if it's, and they're, they can't figure out anything from the history. I'd be concerned about long-standing myasthenia, which that I would look like a constant, constant uh, palsy as opposed to long-standing myasthenia can look like a constant palsy. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. I've seen it in kids where people thought the child had IIH, thought I had a six nerve palsy, and they followed this child and, and he never corrected and they were going to do strabismus surgery two or three. They came as a, a second opinion to me. And I said, and I, sh I could see fatigue ability on their exam. So even, even if they have a, a, um, a, a misalignment, you can show a greater misalignment on fatiguing them. And so that's the, that's the added aspect that you get from myasthenia uh, to make that diagnosis. So I saw him. He was, a, he was a 30 prism diopter. I fatigued him. He got to like 45, 50. And I put him on mestinon. He came back and he, after three years of being the, you know, prisms and going to, his eyes were straight. And so it, that's, you know, that's a very clear, but it, when he was seen by three pretty good strabismus people who were going to do strabismus surgery on him because he had a very fixed alignment. And every time they saw him, he was 45, he was 45 or he was 30, excuse me, he was 30, 30, 30. And then I got him and I saw him at 30, but then I fatigued him to 45. And then I realized, Let me, let's, let's do this. I think this is what's going on, you know? So. Yeah, somebody wanted to know about cover and cover uncover test, both the tests and their significance. Sure. So when you, when you want to look at a, um, um, uh, uh, so you have a misalignment, right? Like this. Um, if I cover one eye, this eye will fixate towards you. Now, if there's a, uh, a palsy issue, um, you, you're going to actually, uh, uh, an eye that's turned in, you will cover on cover, you're going to see that that strabismus, that tropia won't change. But the cover on cover is to show the control that you have. And so, and, and to really identify a tropia, which is a true misalignment, right? So when you do cover on cover, you're looking at each eye cover on cover to see where that eye where that eye wants to sit when you block it. Where is the natural tendency for that eye to sit? Okay, and that's what you're doing with the cover and cover. When you do cover on cover and you go back and forth, you're, break, you're, you're seeing where that eye prefers to sit, but you're also breaking the fusion that you have when, you're, when you have both eyes. So you might see a greater deviation because you've negated the fusion that was presently there. So if the eye is misaligned and they're doing this, and you measure that misalignment uh, and you do cover and cover and you just see it's not moving in terms of shifting. And now you go back and you start to see a greater shift in. You're, you're, you're disrupting the fusion, the fusional aspect that you have at that moment. So, so there's cover on cover and then there's um, continuous sort of cover on cover that you're doing, uh, doing going back in between the eyes. Um, so one is the yeah, true tropia and the other one's the tropia plus the fusional breakdown that you have. Uh, Viral, if uh, sometimes somebody complains of diplopia, but you seem to see the eyes alignment seems all right, then sometimes the cover, uh, the rapid alternate cover test can tell you whether really is there uh, easy, uh, you know, yeah. 
guys and uh, checking it in right case left case can tell you whether it is uh, concomitant or it is a paralytic squint so uh, that sometimes helps uh, in uh, looking in the right gaze left gaze and then doing rapid cover uncover uh, both sure areas. so i i mean uh, it helps with the uh, palsy type issues but but really primary should tell you everything you need to know when you're talking about, and it sounds like what you're talking about is like a foria, because when you're breaking that, you're getting that fusion. So we all have a, a little bit of misalignment. We actually exploit our misalignment. That's why we see depth perception, because there is naturally a misalignment that's giving you that depth perception that you have. So that's, that we all have. Uh, that's the greatest, that's the best use of our misalignment um, uh, is, to, is to have stereo vision. But um, when you, when you, when I'm looking straight and my eyes are fusing and then I break my fusion, you're going to see a natural shift. And that natural shift is that foria that you're talking about. And you should get it in primary because we, we are meant to look at things in primary. So you can have them look at different angles, but it's best to have them in primary fixating on a target um, to, to really figure out the, the control aspect of their eyes. Next question, can you get thyroid ophthalmopathy without muscle enlargement on MRI and vice versa? If there is only muscle enlargement on MRI, but no clinical signs, can we have that sort of presentation? Yeah, you can. Now, um, you know, thyroid, thyroid eye disease um, can come in stages, right? Um, and so if there's an active stage through your thyroid eye disease, it, you can have active inflammation. Um, sometimes we, you know, I, I, when I see a child or I see a young person or young uh, adult and they show irritate, uh, um, uh, they have either a family history or there's some concern that I see of, uh, of their eyes that I'm concerned about thyroid eye disease. You can get imaging and we tend to get imaging with a, a stir image, right? Which shows up the inflammation that's active in the muscle. Now, if you... If you just get a CT scan, the muscle sizes may look the same. They're not fibrotic, right? But you may actually see that there's inflammation in the nerves if you actually get an MRI and look for a stir, what we call a stir sequence, which, is, which would pick up inflammation in the extraocular muscles of active fibrosis. Because it's active, the reason it's, fib, it's fibrotic is there's active inflammation. And you can sometimes see that anteriorly because their eyes will be injected. You know, their conjunctiva, the white part of their eyes, can be injected as well. So if they're having bilateral or, you know, uh, uh, um, eyes um, uh, issue, in, in, in terms of this talk, they're feeling some congestion sometimes, um, but that tends to be a little bit later in more fibrotic cases. Um, you can get imaging and still have thyroid, early thyroid eye disease in that active inflammatory before they see the fibrosis. Now, the other, your other question was, can you see if they're thick eye muscles? What was the other question? I'm sorry. Yeah, thick eye muscles on imaging. You're done imaging for something else. Patient has thyroid disease, but no clinical manifestation. Can that happen? Uh, that, I mean, you better figure out why their eyes are fibrotic. Um, so they're, they're um, uh, if, it, if it, we talked about, we talked about inferior rectus, medial rectus, um, sort of involvement. If you're seeing imaging and they're asymptomatic and you've got imaging and you're seeing bilateral thickened disease uh, and they're asymptomatic, well, it's, it, you better check a thyroid panel. And if the thyroid panel is abnormal, um, then you better treat them for their thyroid disease because being asymptomatic doesn't mean that they're not gonna progress later, right? And you can prevent them from progressing later. So it's kind of like blood pressure. If your blood pressure is pre-hypertensive and I don't treat you, you're, you're going to long-term going to get chronic changes to, to your heart and you may de eventually develop hyper, uh, a larger, uh, a, a more severe hypertension. So why not intervene if, if you're seeing thickened muscles, right? And especially in that distribution suggestive of thyroid. It's worth the, actually checking the blood work. Now, there are other things to think about. Uh, um, uh, I've had some unique cases of amyloidosis, amyloid deposition um, that can happen. Um, and um, uh, I think starting with a thyroid panel first, because that things being common, that's the most common reason.
to see fibrotic muscles. Yeah. Uh, regarding IgG4 and orbital involvement, is there any age preference and are there any advances in treatment? Sure. Um, so that's unique. Um, it's, it's rarer in kids, but I see it, <laughs> you know, uh, and I've seen it in teenagers and, uh, um, but, uh, so I, I, I think when it's, uh, really, really young, you know, th there've been case reports of really young kids having it. Uh, I really question it sometimes, but, um, under, under the age of three or two. And I don't think that's, uh, that didn't se seem right. I think there might've been something else going on. I think the immune system when you're much younger um, is, uh, can have hyper-inflammatory reactions that can cause you um, uh, as you're developing. Uh, and I see it in kids, but um, uh, I think, um, you know, older kids, I would order it. Uh, if, there's a, if there's clear indications from the imaging suggestive of it, I would order it. Um, and, uh, and, and in terms of their clinical exam. Um, the second part of your question was, what was it? It was, uh, I, I don't see your, your questions anymore, but uh, no question. you said. I think we covered all the questions. There's only one question additional. Please yeah. explain three-step three, three step, uh, examination or both no palsy that somebody sure. wanted to know about it. Yeah. Yeah, many more questions you are coming. share your screen. Yeah. Many more questions are on the way. Sure. Okay, you can ask them if you, because I saw only that question. Sorry. No, no, if you check the Q&A, one person has asked, a person may complain of diplopia and all the eye muscle examination may be normal. What to do in that situation? Okay, so I'm going to answer the step, the three-step one first. Yeah. Three Is that okay? Yeah, can yeah. I share? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I hope you can see this. Um, so you're at this point you've talked to the patient him or her and uh, and they've talked to you and they've said i see uh binocular double vision um and when i cover one eye i still have do I, I, double vision goes away i cover the other eye the double vision goes away um then the second you're going to ask them are, what kind of double vision are you seeing and they're going to commonly say with the fourth nerve on your differential is that they're going to say i see it vertical or i see an oblique so it's Horizontal and a vertical component is oblique or vertical, okay? Um, so that's the second way. Th then they're gonna talk to you, when do you see it? You see it all the time. In your exam, you're gonna look at them and you're gonna see, are they compensating? Um, so for a unilateral fourth nerve, you might see a head tilt. This is important and I'm starting off this way because these are important things to observe before you start the step three. Now, if you see them, and in this case scenario, um, I'm, I'm giving you um, uh, a, they have a head tilt that's to the left, okay? Um, and so they're tilting their head to the left, as I am right now, because in a fourth nerve, this eye is sitting higher. So when you start to do the three-step test, you want to keep that head straight because then you're going to see the deviation because they're compensating and you put the light, they're compensating. They'll, when they're doing this, they say, I don't have any double vision, but sometimes I see it. And that's because when they straighten their head, they're actually seeing the vertical double vision, right? But they're actually compensating. And up until a point where they can't compensate or, or they break down, they're seeing the vertical, okay? But you'll see them with that face turn because, because when they're straight, it's like this. And when they're like this, it's better, okay? And their brain figured that out. So you straighten their head. Then you're looking for which eye is higher. If you put a light in front of them and you ask them to fixate on it, the one eye is going to fixate direct, directly on it. The other eye is going to be sitting higher, and you're going to see that the light, uh, the, the corneal light reflection will sit lower, okay? Or if you just look at it, if you see more white space, as in this picture, you see some more white space. This eye is sitting higher than this other eye. So this is a right hypertropia. So step one, which eye is sitting higher, okay? Step two, I would ask them this question. Does your double vision get worse when you look in the right gaze or in the left gaze, okay? Because the eye is sitting higher and up, when it looks to, when it, when it looks to the right gaze, it's gonna be straight. But when it looks to the left gaze, it can't come down because again, the fourth brings that eye in towards it and brings it down. When it goes this way, it can't bring it down so it sits up and shoots up higher. And what you see here is that in the right gaze, because it's the right side, it's fine. 
But when it looks to the left, it shoots up. So it gets, it, it, the eye of concern shoots up in the contralateral gaze. So you ask, is the double vision worse in the right or left? So the way I do this, this is the way I do this. I have them look straight. They're looking at me straight. They're looking a light at me and I can see one eye sitting higher than the other. Then I say, I want you to look right or left. You can have them look right or left and ask them if the double vision get worse or worse. Or the thing you can do is turn their head, right? So if you turn their head this way, they're looking at you in the right, they're in the left gaze. And if I turn their head to the left, they're looking at you in the right gaze. So just keep that in mind. But that to me is easier because they're looking at the target that you want them to look at in this uh, looking right or left. But the question you want to ask is a double vision worse in right or left gaze. So if it's a right-sided hypertropia, it would be uh, worse in the left gaze, okay? And then finally, the third one makes sense because remember, they already have a head tilt in the contralateral reason. The question is now, is the double vision worse in the right or the left head tilt, right? Well, if you have a right hypertropia and they're coming to you with a contralateral left head tilt, you already know the answer to that because in the left tilt, they're compensating. If you turn it to the right, all you have to do is turn it to the right, and they'll say, oh, it's horrible. I can't, I, I can't, I can't. It's really worse. Then you really isolated that that's a right fourth nerve palsy. That eye is higher in primary gaze. That, that eye is worse in, in left gaze and worse in a right head tilt. So, that, that, so the questions are, which eye is sitting higher? Second question is, which eye is it worse in which gaze, right or left gaze? And the third question is, is the double vision worse with a right or left head tilt? Yeah, I think that explains everything. Okay. Uh, you have time, we'll have five more questions. Sure. Yeah, first one, somebody asked, what is the role of Botox, Botox in strabismus? What is the role of Botox and strabismus? Um, so I think, um, so Botox, right, uh, when you inject it into the muscle, uh, that, that what it does is it actually negates that muscle. So it can be useful in situations that you have an acute cranial nerve palsy. Let's say I have a, I have a six nerve palsy. Now this this eye, this, this lateral rectus is not moving this eye out. Well, what's gonna happen, this eye is gonna be ET, so it's gonna be inward, because the medial rectus has unopposed action, right? And so the muscles are like string on, the, on a puppet. If this one, if you cut the string here, the other string is gonna pull that eye inward. So what happens if, if you never regain function in that, in that muscle outward, what happens to the medial rectus? It becomes tight, right? It becomes really tight. Uh, and structurally, and it, and it becomes, uh, uh, almost feels like it's fibrose, but it's not fibrose, it's just really tight, you know, that muscle gets really tight. Um, so to avoid that, what people can do is they can inject that medial rectus muscle um, with Botox so that it weakens that, the contracture uh, of that muscle. That's what the Botox does, right? So it can't contract, and so it relaxes that muscle. So the thought is you can use it in short-term situations in which you can inject it, but a long-term um, fibrotic, I mean, not fibrotic, uh, a muscle that's um, completely tight for a long period of time, Botox won't help because that, there have been chronic changes to that muscle. So the role for Botox is to weaken a muscle that's tight, but it, it, it's really useful in the more acute situations as opposed to um, a muscle that has been chronically. So a third nerve palsy that's been going on for a long period of time, and they come to you and say, hey, I, I, I don't like my eye out here. I would really like you to straighten it for me so that I look you know, more cosmetically better you know, um, uh, at this point. Um, if you inject Botox into that eye has been down and out, the third nerve palsy, it's been out here, you inject Botox into that lateral rectus, it, it, it won't do it any good. For a, for a tight muscle that's been um, a long term, you know, tight. Okay, the next question is Are prisms useful for hemianopia? For what? I'm sorry? For oh, hemianopia. Hemianopia. Oh, yeah. Uh, prisms are. I mean, um, so if you have uh, hemianopia, um, 
it can be quite useful. Um, uh, and um, they have uh, what they call peri lenses, where they actually can bring over. So what happens with hemianopsia uh, is that, um, so let's say I have a, a homonymous, uh, right homonymous uh, hemianopsia. So I, I can, um, I, I see the left half of my field. Well, you can use a, a prism in the periphery to shift the part of the field that you see to make a larger field uh, for you, a field of view for you, right? So if you're seeing some aspect of your field here, let's say 60 degrees here, and you're seeing this peripheral, you know, um, um, 20, 30 degrees, you can shift that over to give you a little bit more of a field by using uh, those um, uh, peri lenses and shifting an image. It really, it, it doesn't help with really central vision, but it can help with um, making an image, um, your field of view larger, right? Because you're not actually fusing in that case, you're actually shifting a field of vision that you have over here and a field of vision you have in one eye over here, and you're sort of making it a larger, uh, a larger field of view. Kind of like, like I, you know, I'm looking with one eye, I'm seeing from here to here, here, I'm seeing from here to here, but this as this, this aspect, which my other eye can't see, and then there's this aspect my other eye can see. What I'm doing is shifting that one over because there's a loss here for that. So I, I do think you, you it, 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 people uh, quite often say it is useful to, to a degree, but it is quite useful. Yeah. And one person has asked, person complains of diplopia, but when you examine all eye movements are normal. What do you do in that situation? <laughs> Um, so, so again, goes back to the question, is it monocular or binocular, right? Binocular. Binocular. So, binocular, so they, they covered each eye, right? Yeah. Okay. Then you got, then you should ask, so it's binocular, ask, tell me what the double vision is. Horizontal, vertical, oblique, right? So, so that helps you. You need to know that information. And then the third thing is, are they getting that double vision near or distance, right? Or are they getting it at the end of the day? Because if, if, if their myasthenia is well controlled, you've just given me that example, right? That they're, but if they're actively having double, um, it could be that they're just slightly fatigued, right? Um, it could be that they have thyroid eye disease and they're slightly congested, but their motilities yeah. are full, yeah? yeah. This question was asked by somebody, but I think in practice, when patients complain of intermittent diplopia and all eye examinations are normal, it could be because of a manifestation of a latent squint. Manifestation? Of a latent squint, when a person is tired, or when a patient yeah. has fever, or any systemic illness, or when patients have any other problem, when the oh, fusional mechanism, mechanisms break, yeah, right. they experience, then, they, then they experience diplopia. In yeah, fact, right. Ma manifestation of latent squint is one of the commonest causes of intermittent diploma. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. We actually talked about that last time about breakdown in fusion, which is quite often can happen. And if you're wide a computer screen uh, for too long, you get a breakdown in fusion. If you have a fever, stress, um, any of those things. I also think it's very common with, I see with uh, people who've gone to surgery. So any brain surgery or anything, they will get commonly consulted and say, hey, We've, we have double vision now. And if it's not in a location that makes any sense um, and it's pr pretty typically horizontal, you give them time, by the time they discharge, it's clear. And that's because they all have an acute decompensation from the fusion aspect, um, uh, 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 both eyes, yeah. Um, then uh, another, another question is, how often, uh, when do you use Maddox or near practice? Um, so, when do you use Maddox for? So, so we, we um, last um, so in our um, first discussion we talked about Maddox rocks using Maddox rocks. Uh, um, um, just rods alone will will measure alignment. So if you're in the bedside exam and you're you're trying to measure their alignment to fuse, you can you can ask the patient by putting the prism up to have them look at a target and say, hey. When, so usually if they're in the bed and there's a clock on the wall and there's a misalignment, you can use the matic rods. First you ask them, is it horizontal or vertical, their deviation? 
If they say it's oblique, that's a separate issue. But if it's horizontal or vertical, you're going to get Maddox rods, which have prisms that are shaped uh, base in, okay? And you're going to put it in that location, um, uh, base in or base out, depending on their horizontal um, uh, uh, deviation. If it's uh, vertical, um, then you're going to put it, you're going to use the vertical uh, Maddox rod, which are rods with prisms that are graded um, and, and, um, uh, from low to high. And what you're doing is, is making that image so that, that things are aligned to give you a number value for your deviation. Okay. Um, and so that's what you use Maddox rods. Now, double Maddox rods was something else we talked about, and that's torsion where you put on these glasses where one has a red filter and a, and a, a different filter, usually a white filter, and you put a light in front. And what you're going to see is because it, it deals with the torsion of the eye, if it's a bilateral fourth and you have extremely high torsion, you're going to see that the align, if you had normal vision, the, eyes, the, the lines would be parallel. But because there's torsion, you're going to see that you're going to be off. And what you can do is you can dial in on the side of the glasses, and that's what I showed in the – uh, pictures last time you can dial in to make those lines parallel and that can show you the degree of torsion at each eye um, to figure out uh, that if it's high enough that it's a bilateral uh, fourth nerve palsy okay i think viral will have to let you sleep uh, <laughs> more questions we'll yeah. email them to you okay of course you and my my information is at the end there so if uh, uh, I put it up, uh, if anybody feels uh, they need to email me, feel, please feel, feel free to. Thank you for an excellent yes, session. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, of of course. course. Yeah, I will let you know. Hmm? Okay. All right. Thank Thanks. You. Have a good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank thanks. You. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Dhananjay. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, thank okay. you.